Friday evening. You're watching The Devi Show and the team and I are thrilled you chose to spend the next 30 minutes with us. It's another cracker episode tonight as we take you deep into a scam so big your head will spin at the numbers and then introduce you to a brave, bold South African woman doing a whole other kind of spinning. But here are the details of what we're dishing up tonight. It's called litigation funding fraud. It's alleged over 500 million rands went into it and some participants are still waiting for the promised payout. So what return did he promise you? Um, 10,000 rand, a million rand return. At the end of the day, I will get 250 million rand. Her name is Stacey Lee May. She's the queen of smoke. She ran circles around me and I sat terrified while she did it. It's been called the biggest litigation funding fraud scheme ever in South Africa. This scam is nothing like you've ever heard of before, involving massive amounts of moolah and a master conman and his accomplices who took over 300 victims for a merry ride for over a decade. But here's how it happened. This is a story of wild promises, shattered dreams and a case of legal make-believe. And it may involve literally hundreds of victims across South Africa. Mari Bowman is a pensioner who had her golden years of retirement ahead of her. We met her in Ellsberg on the East Rand. I went on pension five years ago and um, just after I went on pension, Gerard Sneiman contacted me about money that they needed for a court case that was they were busy doing with the government. She began giving away her life's earnings week after week. Why? Because she was promised a truly massive pot of gold. Eventually, he came up with a letter that I actually signed with him and Gert Moorman to say that whatever I invest, at the end of the day, I will get 250 million rand. Another victim was Flip Hutton from Kempton Park. He made it sound so good that I think anybody will invest in him. He too was sucked in by the promise of an absolute fortune. So what return did he promise you? Um, 10,000 rand, a million rand return. Did it not sound unbelievable at the time? There is one of the letters that he, he sent to me um, for the amount of 10,000 rand. He will give us 1 million rand. When I phoned him about this, he said, your 10,000 rand will be out of pocket for only a week. Within a week, you will have a million rand back. Mari had been happily retired with money in the bank and debt free. But the offer of 250 million rands was too tempting to resist. I was thinking of my children and myself and my life going forward. You can get yourself a decent property, move to wherever you think it's going to be nice, make your children's lives better. The investment Mari and the others were being asked to pay into is called litigation funding. In a nutshell, investors help pay the legal fees for serious court cases and then share in the profits when they win. Private investigator Chad Thomas is on the case. So what is litigation funding? Litigation funding is nothing new, it's nothing unusual. If one looks at the Vodacom Please Call Me case, the particular person that sued Vodacom didn't have sufficient funds to keep the matter going in the High Court. So he found investors. So people pay to invest in the legal fees, to pay for the attorneys, to pay for the advocates, and in return, they get a percentage of the settlement. This particular scheme was allegedly run by a man called Waterman Belling, and he had several lieutenants who recruited for him. One of them was Gerard Sneeman, who had initially approached Mari Bowman with the offer. Every single morning, Belling would generate a message to his lieutenants he would send that message via WhatsApp to his lieutenants. His lieutenants would then distribute that countrywide through their various WhatsApp groups to all the victims who are dotted throughout the Republic. Mm. Later that afternoon or the next day, funds would start trickling into whatever accounts he would be using to launder that money from the primary account that was under the control of Gerard. 
And he would draw that money either at the casino or at ATMs in and around Mossel Bay. But in this case, there was no case. Just a big black hole that investors poured money into. They would phone me and say that they need 20,000 pounds, or they need 26,000, or they would need 50,000, or they would need 70,000. And then we go to the bank and I would draw the money in cash and give it to them. For all I've given already was almost a million rand. Stefanus van Rensburg spoke to us on behalf of five more victims who also invested in the scheme. I've put in 379,000. And the total value, if we had to add up everybody that's in your group, the five of you, what's the total value? It must be very close or just above 10 million rand. That's a lot of money. Chad Thomas was hired by Stefanus van Rensburg and his group to hunt down the more than 10 million rands they had lost between them. Several red flags had emerged that had them very, very concerned whether the investment was in fact in litigation funding, whether it was in fact a protected investment. Other victims were also starting to get suspicious. When did you smell a rat? When the amounts got to millions. Um, and and when you phone Gerard Sneijman, he doesn't answer his phone. Then he started blocking us on WhatsApp. He blocked the, our numbers that we couldn't phone him anymore. That's when, when we know, okay, our money is gone. Mari Bowman gave and gave some more. And when she ran out of money, she borrowed from the bank to give even more. She was caught in a terrible trap, but couldn't see it. I had no, no debt whatsoever. So I went back and I made an overdraft, took another overdraft. So plus my pension, plus all the extra money that I had, I gave to them. At the end, I had nothing. Mari Bowman still believed her big payday was coming. There's a big difference here between a thousand rand and a million rand. How is a thousand rand going to become a million rand? This is what made the scheme so clever. In my 28 years of investigation, I've never come across a scam where it's complete and utter trust. These people were able to convince people without any paperwork whatsoever that they were litigants in a massive court case that was going to be paying out billions upon billions of rands. How much do you think was collected from people over the years? At the low end, 50 million. At the high what? end, 500 million. There must be more than 300 investors in this. If five of us invested 10 million rand, how yeah. much money did 300 invest? When Flip Hutting began asking the tough questions, they got tough on him. When we started asking for paperwork of any court case that you have attended or a case number, that's when, when another guy, um, Paul Salzen, got involved and he actually started threatening me. When I started putting pressure on, on, on Gerard Sneijman, I had a call from Holzhausen and he said, I know where you are staying, I'm coming for you at your house. And after giving all she had, Mari was now on her last legs financially and was forced to sell her house. Gerard heard that I sold the property from the money that I made after I gave half to my ex-husband. I still gave him another 150,000 rand from there. This to me stands out as one of the biggest advance fee scams in South Africa. Nobody knows what the actual court case is. They don't know any court numbers. They don't know any court dates. They don't know who the attorneys are. They don't know who the advocates are. Because it's a fairy tale. It's a complete and utter fabrication. Where is he? Coming up, we go in search of the alleged litigation fraud kingpin, Waterman Belling. How do you feel about the fact that you've taken all these people's money and where's the money? No, no, no. no my lawyer, you please. But where is the money? There's my lawyer. You can, you can talk for questions. yourself. Welcome back. Before the break, we detailed the first part of our investigation into one of the biggest litigation funding fraud scams in the country, which promised massive returns, but kept investors hanging for years. In part two, we connect the dots and go looking for the alleged kingpin, Waterman Belling.
Chad Thomas and his team began piecing together sources of information from all over South Africa. And this led them to the coastal town of Mossel Bay in the Western Cape, where they discovered a man named Gert de Kok running a butchery just a few hundred meters from the local police station. And then the breakthrough when police realized this man was actually Waterman Belling, wanted on a fraud charge dating back to 2006, all the way back in Krugersdorp, Johannesburg. Yes. Waterman Belling was arrested in a dawn raid on the 17th of July at this Mossel Bay home. This arrest made it possible to launch the litigation fraud case, which is now registered with the Hawks in the Western Cape. We now realize Cat the Cock, Cat Moorman is in fact Walter McBelly. You realize this is reading like a thriller, just listening to this story. That's the job of an investigator. Do we know if people are still contributing and still thinking that they, they need to pay? Yes. No, yes. Chad. Yes, yes, yes. There's maybe 1% of somebody's brain that says maybe this is real. 99% is, is, is shouting at them that this is fake, but they want to believe that 1%. Mm. They've invested so heavily, yeah. not just their money, but they've invested their time. Their family have told them that they're stupid, greedy, naive, and they want to prove their family's wrong, that they want to believe it's genuine. There it is. Meanwhile, since his arrest in Mossel Bay on the 2006 fraud case, Walterman Belling had been transported back to Johannesburg to appear at the Krugersdorp Magistrates Court. Where is he? This was our opportunity to see for ourselves the man also known as Gert Mulman and confront him. Yeah. Mr. Belling, how do you feel about the fact that you've taken all these people's money and where's the money? No, no, no. No Here's comment. My lawyer, Thank you, but where is the money? There's my lawyer. You can, you can no talk for yourself. Please. What name are you going as currently? You've got um, so many names. Who are you today? Just say no comment. Okay? Hey? You may have no comment now, yeah. but you certainly had a lot of comment what on those WhatsApp groups. Are yeah, you going to give back the money? That's correct. You are going to give back the money? Correct. So he did hesitate when he had to write his name in the register. I'm not surprised because when you go by so many names, you will get confused. Inside the courthouse in courtroom D, Mr. Belling spoke to us again while awaiting his turn to appear before the magistrate. He admitted he was aware of the allegations. I don't want to get other people unnecessarily in trouble. Hmm. You see, but yes, I, I, I am. I am. I was part of it. Say it like that. I only have one more question. Yes. They're saying that you took tens of millions. Yeah. Is that true? My, my dumb, no. Then where did the money go? No, let's speak. Let's speak. No comment. I've, I've asked nicely. No comment. Why don't you give me your name? I didn't want to. But why? Because you didn't listen when I said professionally, please don't comment. Don't wag your no, finger in my face. Belling promised us a meeting where he would tell his side of the story as soon as he was finished in court. But later, he refused to take our calls. Then we travelled to Kempton Park to give Herat Sneeman a chance to tell his side of the story. I'm looking for Herat! Is he not here? He wasn't home, but we reached him by telephone. Hi, sir, Herat? Yes. Hi, uh, Herat Sneeman. Yes, can I help you? Okay, I need to speak to you. It is quite urgent. Uh, it's about Mr. Belling. Okay, right, okay. I'll get back to you. I'll let you know, right? But that was the last we heard of him, despite several attempts to reach him again. At Sneeman's residence, we instead found Henny Krobler, who said even he had lost money. You know the whole situation. Oh, you see, you know what I'm talking about. Mr. Benning? Yes. Mr. Gert Moolman? Yes. The fat guy? Yes. Did he take your money too? My dear? 700,000? No. Are you kidding? No, I'm serious. It's devastating to think that I had everything. A house, a car, no debt. And at the moment I'm sitting with more debt than ever. But Chad is hopeful. I'm exceptionally confident that we will see the mastermind, his lieutenants, 
and the group leaders in the dock in the not too distant future. We'll keep a close eye on that story for you, but it needs to be echoed. If somebody is selling you something which is too good to be true, then there's a good chance that you are being fed lies. After the break, she isn't called the queen of smoke for nothing. This young woman from Eldos has been spinning circles, real circles, around everybody. We continue to mark Women's Month here on The Davy Show and for a while now, I've been wanting to introduce the Queen of Smoke, Stacey Lee May, to you. She's from El Dorado Park and started her unusual hobby as a result of being bullied in high school. She's a daredevil from behind the wheel of her pink BMW, but I'm not going to say much more except, best you hold on to your seats. Dubbed the Queen of Smoke, Stacey Lee May is one of South Africa's top female spinners. This 24-year-old from El Dorado Park certainly knows how to handle herself on the track. Stacey Lee, how does a girl get involved in this kind of hobby? My dad made me do it. That's all I can say. Um, I was bullied a lot in high school because I was always younger than everybody else. I actually matriculated at 16. And I was an introvert because of that. And my dad thought that putting me into car spinning would just help boost my confidence a little bit. And we didn't know it would turn into something so amazing. So it's my dad's fault. <laughs> my friend came actually to me and he says, hey, I'm looking for a female to help us with this introduction. And I said, yeah, Stacy, let's try this. And they took me up to an empty parking lot. I was so nervous, I was shaking. <laughs> But like after 15 minutes, I just got the hang of it and I couldn't stop. It was just in me. How old were you at the time? I was 17. At first, Stacy Lee's mom was concerned for her daughter's safety. The mom was like, you're a girl, you can't do this. Stace, don't do this. This is for guys. You don't listen to your father. You can't do this, you're going to get hurt. I was more like, do it. All that changed when her mom noticed the positive impact the final year law student was making. When I saw the crowd's reaction and the little girls that would come to her and be inspired by her, then I started warming up and encouraging her to be better and to do better for herself. So many little girls came up to me and they're like, we want to be just like you. And I just encouraged them to say, you can do anything you set your mind to because the sky is not the limit. The universe is just keep pushing and show the world that you are amazing, strong, independent woman. Tell me when you started getting famous, and I'm talking about outside of the spinning circles, drifting circles. I wouldn't consider myself as famous. No, you are. Just... Stacey Lee, you are famous. <laughs> Charlize Theron came to your house. Charlize Theron didn't come to my house, therefore you are famous. That's right. Charlize Theron paid a visit to Stacey Lee's home. Charlize wanted Stacey Lee to be in her Netflix special, Hyperdrive. This is really bad. A show featuring international drifting drivers. What did that feel like when it starts to happen? It's just the look on my parents' face. It's they're so proud and like it makes me happy. That's all. Like I don't see myself as famous. I just see myself as making my parents proud. It was surreal. It was amazing. I felt proud to be a mom. She kissed me. <laughs> That's all you remember? Yes. Even for her to get into that car and trust Stacy to say, can I go for a spin with you? It was just, she, Stacy made history. To stand out, this daredevil and her dad came up with a nail-biting stunt called the suicide slide, not to be tried at home. When Stacy jumped out the car and she did a suicide, she smacked me. Who, oh, Charlie? Yeah, she smacked me behind my head. She's like, what the f I can know on? <laughs> but then she grabbed me, then she grabbed me, she said, thank you. How did the suicide slide get its name? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is a story. I was outside and I watched them because I heard the car coming up and I'm like, what the heck are you guys doing? She says, no, 
I'm trying this thing to hang upside down. I said, you're going to commit suicide. You're going to kill yourself. And she's like, hmm, that's the name, the suicide slide. When we're in the United States, when she did a suicide, the people, everyone came to a standstill at Hyperdrive. Sadly, Stacy Lee's time on Hyperdrive was cut short. I didn't complete because my car broke, but just the fact that I went and I tried to represent my country as best as I can was amazing. What's the look like on people's faces in a new area when you, after you do your thing, you climb out the car? People are always shocked when they see me getting out of the car. Usually when we show up at like um, an event or something, people always think my dad's the driver. And I'm like, such a big man driving a pink car. Are you guys serious? And I'm like, yeah, this isn't a woman thing. And then I get into the car and their minds are blown. I wanted to see Stacy Lee's talent up close. That's how I ended up here. This girl's praying. Maybe I should too. Still praying. Maybe a bit more for good measure. Can't hurt. <laughs> for many things, right? I can I can walk into dangerous places, I can do a lot of things. But I have to show you this. This is what Stacy Lee did to me. <laughs> I'm shaking. She's, she's 24 years old. <laughs> Her parents have this to say about supporting your children. Don't pursue your dream, pursue your child's dream. Figure out what they good at. Listen to them. Listen, take the advice and push them. Look at me. I come from El Dorado Park, which is known for drugs and gangsterism. And I was bullied a lot in high school. So I overcame my fears and I just took the world by storm. I mean, the world is your canvas and you should paint it how you, sh how you want it to look. I still feel dizzy just watching that. And that's our cue to exit. We'll be back next Friday, same time, same place, same magic. If you have any story ideas to share, especially narratives around young South Africans who are forging ahead in unusual fields, then drop us the deets via devi at etv.co.za. From me and the Devi team, until next time, heads up South Africa, let's keep our eyes fixed on the horizon. We've got this.